Good evening and welcome to the second event of the 2022 Digger Debate Series. My name is Sarah Muirhoff. I'm a political reporter for BT Digger. Tonight, we will hear from three candidates looking to succeed Jim Condos as Vermont's Secretary of State. In the coming weeks, we'll host several additional debates ahead of the August 9th primary election. Next Wednesday, June 15th, we'll hold a live debate at the Paramount Theater in Rutland featuring candidates for Lieutenant Governor. On Tuesday, June 28th, we'll welcome candidates for the US House to the Double E Performance Center in Essex Junction. And on Wednesday, July 13th, we'll hear from candidates for Attorney General in another online only debate. We've also got a full slate of general election debates coming up in September and October. For more information and to reserve tickets, visit btdigger.org. And now a note from the sponsor of this event. The 13,000 members of Vermont NEA are proud to sponsor tonight's debate because they know the impact public policy has in our state's classrooms. They encourage all Vermonters to learn about the candidates and then to go out and vote. This debate is made possible by you. VT Digger is a nonprofit news organization powered by our contributing members. To support the journalism we do and the debates we host, please visit vtdigger.org slash donate. Before I introduce the candidates and moderators, I would like to briefly outline the format and rules of this debate. Candidates will have the opportunity to deliver brief opening remarks before facing questions from our moderators. Candidates will generally have 90 seconds to respond. The moderators may pose brief follow-up questions or allow another candidate to respond if named. Twice tonight, we will turn over the questioning to the candidates themselves. Each will have the opportunity to pose a question to an opponent of their choosing. Finally, we will expect to end with a lightning round during which the candidates will answer questions in just a few words. A quick technical note, Closed captions are available by clicking the CC button on your video player. These captions are automatically generated and may contain some errors. I now have the pleasure of introducing our candidates and moderators. Joining us tonight are three Democratic candidates for Secretary of State. Representative Sarah Copeland Hansess of Bradford has served in the Vermont House since 2005, including as Majority Leader and now as Chair of the House Government Operations Committee. John Odom of Montpelier has served as Montpelier City Clerk for the past decade and is a certified public hacker. And Deputy Secretary of State Chris Winters of Berlin has worked in the Secretary of State's office for 25 years, including as Director of the Office of Professional Regulation and now as Deputy Secretary. I'll note that VT Digger is not holding debates for the Republican or Progressive primary for Secretary of State because only one candidate has entered each of those primary races. Finally, I'd like to introduce our moderators for the evening, VT Digger political reporter, Lola Dufour and managing editor, Paul Hines. Lola and Paul, take it away. Thank you. We'll begin this evening with opening statements from each of the candidates. While introducing yourselves to voters, please tell us what experience you have that prepares you to serve as Vermont's next Secretary of State. You will each have about 90 seconds. Representative Copeland Hansis, uh, you get to go first. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Um, thank you and thanks to the NEA for sponsoring tonight's event. Uh, access to democracy is, uh, is indeed important and I thank our uh, teachers union for their support here tonight. Um, now more than ever, electing champions of democracy is critical. Um, I'm running for Vermont Secretary of State to ensure that all Vermonters can have their voices heard in Vermont elections. Under my leadership in the House, I've prioritized election reforms that put civic engagement and uh, voter accessibility at the forefront. Uh, when COVID-19 hit, I led efforts to enact universal vote by mail to ensure everyone had safe access to the ballot box. And in 2021, following that successful vote by mail, I led the efforts to make that uh, vote by mail permanent. As your next Secretary of State, I will continue to lead the charge on strengthening democracy and preserving democracy in Vermont. Uh, we can and should lead the way. 
In addition to my work protecting and strengthening democracy, I've also uh, worked on many other issues, including setting Vermont on a path to meet its climate reduction goals, uh, bringing us closer to reproductive liberty for all, guaranteeing Oh, shoot. Yeah, I am. It appears maybe we lo uh, we lost Representative Copeland hands us. Um, but if everybody else is still um, able to see and hear each other, why don't we move ahead to the next uh, person to speak and then we can go back to Representative Copeland hands us when she returns to us. Um, so uh, we'll next go to you, uh, Deputy Secretary Winters. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you for giving this us this opportunity tonight and thank you to the Vermont NEA for sponsoring the debate. My name is Chris Winters. I'm the Deputy Secretary of State and when Jim Condos told me he was retiring, I knew I had to step up because I know how much is at stake. The challenges we face today are like nothing we've ever seen before. Election integrity is under attack. Nationally, access to voting is being restricted in ways we couldn't have imagined just a few years ago. Yet here in Vermont, we're expanding the right to vote. And we're a national leader in elections and in the many other important services Vermonters and Vermont businesses rely on from our office every single day. Vermont needs an experienced and effective leader with a track record of results. I'm doing the job already. I'm passionate about this work and I'm committed to leveraging my experience, 25 years of public service in the Secretary of State's office including the last seven as deputy secretary, to ensure that we uphold that excellence and we build on it. I'm proud to be the first person in my family to go to college. I'm a father of four great kids. I'm driven to make our state a better place. As a state employee, as a school board chair, or as a little league coach, I just want to solve problems and be of service. I want this job, I'm passionate about this office, and I'm dedicated to this work. Right now, Vermont needs stability and continuity in the Secretary of State's office. I'm the only candidate who can hit the ground running and I'll be ready to lead on day one. All right, City Clerk Odom, it's your turn. Hey folks, thanks for having this. And yes, thanks to Vermont NEA, this is, this is terrific. Um, I'm John Odom. I've been City Clerk in Montpelier for the last 10 years. Before that, I had a, a, a very long couple decades run working primarily in electoral politics in Vermont and elsewhere. In fact, I, I originally expected that becoming city clerk was gonna be my retirement from politics. So that, that didn't quite work out. I'm running for uh, a number of reasons. Uh, one is that I'd like to bring the perspective of a municipal clerk to the Secretary of State's office. Municipal clerks, town clerks, we do, Basically, a lot of the stuff that the Secretary of State is responsible for, but in a completely different level. We manage local licensing, we, we run elections, we run the archives for our towns, but we do it in a neighbor to neighbor way. And that's really a big part of the reason why I'm asking for support for this job. I think you'll see every 10 years or so, 10 years ago it was Jim Condos, before that Deb Markowitz, you get an outsider come into the office who really can shake things up and take some different approaches. And what I'm here is to hopefully convince you all that I'm the next person in that line to do it. I, as you mentioned, I'm a certified ethical hacker, um, which means that I have hands-on experience in election cybersecurity. And this is something I'm talking about a lot. Um, I have advocated, and you'll hear me advocate for a new model of election cybersecurity that I think given the increased threats we're facing just in the last couple of months is gonna be necessary. I think Vermont can lead the world. I am on the advisory board of the University of Chicago's Cyber Policy Initiative. And through that work, I have sometimes been at odds with the National Association of Secretaries of State. Sometimes I've worked at odds with my own clerks association, but I hope to bring that experience. I'm sorry, Mr. Odom, you're over time. Oh, I'm a babbler, sorry. Okay. <laughs> It looks uh, as if we have Representative Copeland Hansis back with us, and uh, we lost you toward the end of your opening um, remarks. So if you want to 
pick back up where you think you left off. Um, we'll give you another uh, 45 seconds or so to finish that thought, and then we'll move on to the questions. Uh, well, it's anybody's guess where you lost me, um, but I was talking about how in 2021, I led the charge to enact universal vote by mail uh, on a permanent basis. Um, and I'm a, a leader who's never shied away from complex or complicated issues. Um, in my 18 years of public service, I have also worked on establishing a requirement that Vermont meet its greenhouse gas emissions reduction targets, uh, brought us closer to reproductive liberty for all by advancing a constitutional amendment, which will be on your ballot in November. Um, and <clears throat> I brought uh, I, I worked on guaranteed uh, sick days for Vermont's workers and established a regulated cannabis market that ensures consumer protection and youth prevention uh, while prioritizing uh, restoring historical harms. I wanna take the skills and um, passion that, that I have uh, demonstrated over the 18 years that I've been in the house and take those to work to defend democracy in Vermont. Thank you very much. And we will now turn to questions for each of the candidates. You will each have 90 seconds to answer these questions and we reserve the right to ask follow-up questions, which should be answered in no more than 30 seconds. So to begin, I would like each of you to name the single greatest threat facing Vermont elections and what will you do to address it? And we'll start with City Clerk Odom. Well, that's a big question. Um, of course, from my experience, I'm going to be concerned, and I think most of us should be, about foreign mischief in our elections. Uh, you'll see, in, you'll see in the Mueller report from a few years ago, uh, a little corner of it. It talked about uh, foreign actors trying to get into statewide election systems, statewide databases. It said that all 50 states were actually probed for weaknesses. According to the report, only one state was penetrated, but that's not something we can assume is true. As a certified ethical hacker, I can tell you, it takes an average of 250 days to detect a hack. And it's not simply about getting through from the outside like a movie style hacker. We've got to watch out for all our local, um, local election administrators, the local clerks who are running these who run our, our elections are uniquely at risk for attacks from foreign interests. What I would wanna do is create a new paradigm whereby first of all, we put out dedicated computer systems, dedicated computers to all our clerks on managed networks, computers that nobody is checking their email on, nobody is going and checking the web on, secure, lock down that avenue. Secondly, I think we need to get away from the model of using these opaque corporations. Currently, we're, we're using a company called PCC, and I know the Secretary of State is looking at that. But these opaque corporations that run our elections are problematic. They are not secure. We need to work on developing our own system in an open source context that we can then prove a model to the rest of the country and lead the country. Thank you, Mr. Odom. Uh, we will now turn to Representative Copeland Hansis. So single greatest threat. Um, I've got a couple to choose from. Uh, you know, we see reports about active voter suppression. We see um, elections deniers working to infiltrate Secretary of State's offices across the country. Uh, we see intentional misinformation trying to erode people's trust in democracy. Um, those are all really um, important threats that we need to have a Secretary of State prepared and equipped to deal with. Um, I think the single biggest threat is that we no longer know how to disagree with each other without being disagreeable. I grew up in a politically diverse family where we watched the six o'clock news and talked about politics and debated uh, current events. Uh, at the dinner table. Um, I have 18 years of experience in the legislature uh, talking with all of my constituents from uh, both ends of the political spectrum and everywhere in between. Um, as your next Secretary of State, I would reinstate the uh, education and outreach coordinator position that existed under Deb Markowitz uh, time as Secretary of State 
And we would really get back out into our schools to engage with young people on how to participate in democracy, out into our communities to, uh, to encourage people to exercise uh, that, that ability to agree without being disagreeable. I think it's time that we get back to the proverbial dinner table and uh, learn how to talk to each other again. Thank you very much. And uh, finally, to Deputy Secretary Winters, the single greatest threat facing Vermont elections and what you would do about it. Seven, almost eight years ago, when I started as Deputy Secretary of State, I would have said cyber attacks were the greatest threat. Um, it's still a threat. But today, I'd say the greatest threat that we have is the weakened confidence voters have in our elections processes. And that's happening because of social media, uh, because of partisan news outlets and the constant divisiveness and win at all cost approaches of people who know better. I've been on the front lines defending against the misinformation and intentional disinformation campaigns. And those are designed to sow division, to undermine our democratic process. I believe that transparency and education are the keys to restoring this confidence. We work constantly in the Secretary of State's office to issue transparent, trusted, official information through the resources like our website and our social media accounts. Uh, but it can be difficult when, when a piece of insidious information can reach thousands and even millions of people in a matter of minutes. As I've often said, we need to take a holistic and more proactive approach to defending democracy. And that's through cybersecurity, that's through good laws, that's also through civic engagement, civil discourse, and media literacy. We can't give up this fight, and we need to keep pushing back, just like we did when the Presidential Commission on Election Integrity came for your voter data. We turned them away. I've been in this fight for years. I've been doing the work, and I'm committed to maintaining Vermont's trust in safe, secure, and accurate elections. Thank you. We'll now turn to our next question. Last year, the legislature passed and the governor signed a new law requiring that all registered voters automatically receive a ballot in the mail ahead of general elections. But Vermont's universal mail-in voting law does not apply to primary elections or local elections, should it? If so, how would you address the cost and the logistical challenges? And we will uh, start where we left off with Deputy Secretary Winters. Thank you, Paul. That's a great question. We're really proud of vote by mail. We're happy that the legislature gave us the authority to go ahead and implement it on the ground. It was really difficult in 2020, but it led to record-breaking voter, voter turnout in the middle of an election, in the middle of a, of a pandemic, uh, and a presidential election is one of the, the things that I'm most proud of in my career. Um, so it was so great that we came back to the legislature in the following year, and with the help of the House and Senate Government Operations Committees and all kinds of stakeholders, we were able to pass vote by mail, and now we're implementing it again for this election um, with a little more time to prepare and get things uh, really safe and secure. Um, so it, it increases turnout. It's a great thing. Vermonters love it. I love it. I love being able to sit at the dinner table uh, with my family, with my daughter who just turned uh, 18, uh, to fill out her ballot for the first time. You can research candidates. Vote by mail is a great thing. For the primary, it's a little more complicated. You have three ballots. You have to uh, fill out one, send the other two back, get them in the right envelopes. It's heavier, so it's going to cost more in the mailing. And then when it comes to local elections, you have many different municipalities in one election, so it's really complicated to coordinate all those and can be expensive, and we shouldn't put that burden on towns. Um, so right now they have the authority to do it on their own. It's optional for them, but they have to pay for it. So we're actually charged with producing a study, a, a report back to the legislature in January to look at the pros and cons of expanding vote by mail to the primary and to the local elections. There are a lot of pluses and a lot of minuses. I'm looking forward to having all the stakeholders at the table, gathering a lot of information and providing some good information to the legislature so they can make that decision with us. But it's a, it's a, it's a tough Thank question. You. We're, gonna, we're gonna have to cut you off there to keep it to 90 seconds. Um, and uh, next up, we'll hear from City Clerk Odom. Uh, again, should the universal mail-in voting law apply to primaries and local elections? And if so, how would you address the cost and logistical challenges? 
Oh, I love the universal mailing law, and I think it should apply to every election. I recognize that there are pluses and minuses, but I think the minuses are financial and logistic. And I'll give you an example. Uh, here in Montpelier, uh, our city council, and I certainly supported this, uh, chose to go and run a local vote by mail election for our municipal elections. Due to some of the complexities of interacting with other entities such as our union school district, it actually created a disincentive for the city to do that. So we need to, there, there's some legislative fixes for that that I think could re-incentivize cities, a city like Montpelier. And again, we really wanted to do it, but we just couldn't make it happen. Uh, so there's legislative fixes there. As far as the money goes, I think it's just, you know, it's, it's critical infrastructure, our elections. The, the Department of Homeland Security has designated it that. So roads are critical infrastructure, but we put the money into them they need, or at least theoretically we do, and we shouldn't be any different with, um, with election infrastructure. Finally, yeah, I totally agree with Chris. It's complicated in the primary. I think that primary process needs to be simplified. It's confusing for folks. It, from an environmental standpoint, it creates an enormous amount of paper waste. And I think we should look at ways to simplify that entire election, which, you know, therefore would really enable vote by mail in that context. Great, thank you very much. And finally, to Representative Copeland hands us, uh, do you support expanding universal mail in voting uh, to other elections? And if so, how? Um, Fingers crossed that my internet doesn't flake out like it did um, during the first question. Um, so I think that this is a conversation that that is really important to have uh, with Vermonters and with Vermont communities in particular with respect to local elections. What we have to recognize um, about moving to universal vote by mail for adopting your local budget or electing your select board or uh, or passing a school budget, um, it it means the end of um, of town meeting as we know it. And town meeting is a wonderful experience for those who are um, uh, fortunate enough to be able to participate in it in their small communities. And that exercise in direct democracy really does demand that we sit uh, shoulder to shoulder with our neighbors and talk about the issues facing our towns. Um, I wouldn't want to uh, take that away from local communities without uh, Vermonters having a robust uh, engagement process in figuring out how we do local elections. Uh, there are some complexities with respect to adopting school budgets uh, that I think are workable, and that might be a separate question because most um, most school budgets are um, are not adopted by a robustly attended um, uh, school district meeting. Um, and then with respect to the primaries, there's a lot of voter education that needs to go on out there. And as we have more experience with universal vote by mail in the general election, maybe we'll find that voters feel more comfortable with, I have to put my ballot in the envelope, I have to sign in the right place, I have to put one envelope into the other, we might be able to get there. Uh, but again, I think we should engage with Vermonters on how and when to do that. Thank you very much, Representative Copeland Hansis. And over to you, Lola. All right. Uh, Vermont's Public Records Act states that officers of government are trustees and servants of the people, and it is in the public interest to enable any person to review and criticize their decisions, even though such examination may cause inconvenience or embarrassment. And yet, Vermont statute includes dozens of exemptions to the Public Records Act. Would you advocate for reducing the number of exemptions in order to make records more accessible to the public? And if so, what would you scrap? Uh, Representative Copeland Hansis, you get to go first. Uh, thank you, Lola. I, um, I love that question because um, I've had the experience uh, since the beginning of COVID uh, of really seeing a transformation in terms of openness and accessibility of our legislative process. It used to be if you wanted to be able to see um, what the committee was talking about or what uh, witnesses or testimony they heard, you needed to be able to come into the building um, and, and cram your way into a teeny tiny committee room in order to hear that. 
Um, and we have learned a lot in the last two years about how to make government more open and accessible. Um, and I think that uh, most of the advances that we can make in the future uh, will be around making things accessible um, via the internet. Um, there is always um, a, a, a balance though. Uh, I know how much time was taken up by members of the Legislative Council staff in order to fulfill um, public records requests that went beyond just being able to watch the YouTube uh, conversation or see what the committee discussion was. Um, and we need to find ways to make that information open and accessible to Vermonters um, without overly burdening um, strapped uh, and, and tiny staff because in Vermont, our government is really Vermont size, right? We're Vermont scale and, uh, and we don't have a whole legion of people um, who sit uh, waiting to fulfill um, a, a long and lengthy extensive public records request. So I think this is a, a work in progress for us. I guess just to clarify, are you saying that you're not sure that any exemptions need to come out? Um, I am not sure that we need to remove exemptions. I think we need to make sure that uh, the exemptions that exist are being applied equally across all uh, branches and all levels of government. Okay, thank you. Uh, Deputy Secretary Winters, you get to go next. Sure. <clears throat> I plan to continue the, the great work I think that, that Jim Condos and I have done around the public's right to know. It's about accountability, it's about public participation, and it's about trust. And I strongly believe that transparency in government is the key to rebuilding trust and is needed more today than it's ever been needed before. Um, when things are done behind closed doors or um, slammed through without adequate public input or without listening to those at the table, that trust gets eroded. So for years, I've provided municipal assistance and daily guidance to citizens um, and um, agencies and select board and school board members about their interactions uh, with their state and local government and their citizens. And every other year, I've toured the state with Secretary Condos on what we call the transparency tour educating hundreds of Vermonters about the ways in which they can know what their government is up to and how to hold their leaders accountable. Um, I championed the creation of an ethics commission. I wrote a Supreme Court brief on the winning side of a suit supporting greater records access. And I'm an advocate today for continuing remote access to meetings in these shifting times as a way to improve public participation. That's all a way of saying transparency is really important. It's important to citizens. It's important to the media as the public's watchdog. It's important to me as the records officer for our agency so that people can understand um, that when state, the state is doing the people's business, it has to be accountable to them. There are 200 plus exemptions scattered throughout the statutes. It's really hard to keep track. Legislative Council does a good job of compiling those. Um, they, they could be reduced. They could be drastically reduced. It's gonna take hard work. It's gonna take courage, but states like Florida and some other places have way, way fewer exemptions. Um, and I hope that the legislature will take this up again. And I would, I would lead that conversation if I was your next Secretary of State. All right, I think it's uh, City Clerk Odom's turn. This is a great question. I love this question. I could go off on this forever. Um, yeah, well, first of all, I think we can all agree that, I, hopefully we can all agree that transparency is key to having a functional inclusive democracy. And, you know, Chris has done a great job advising folks. I had a meeting with him earlier today, actually, where we were going over this very stuff. And, and you did a great job, Chris. Thank you for your help. Sure. Uh, <laughs> you know, and one of the things we did talk about, and this I found out today was something that Chris agrees with as well. So I'm, you know, I'm pitching him a little, is the idea of creating an ombudsperson's office to help guide folks through the process, maybe even guide them towards what would appropriately be legal action if they have something. Since so much of the, the details and the nitty gritty of the open records law ends up getting worked out in courts. Now, having said that, in terms of exemptions, I think when you have that many exemptions, we've got a little bit of a Frankenstein monster in this law going on here. And I think it'd probably be worthwhile to step back and look at it from the bottom up. Uh, there's ways that it should be modernized also, maybe with less of an emphasis on actual physical documents and more on actual information. 
Now, having said all that, I do know that it can be weaponized. I've uh, seen it weaponized. I've heard this from other municipalities, and that's a problem. So we also need to look at how to deal with that. So it's not just used as a tool to cause mischief, which you know, degrades it as a tool for those who would you know, need to access information, need that public accountability. And that's a tougher question. Um, and I guess I'm out of time, so I won't give you my thoughts on it, but uh, maybe another time. Uh, that actually leads into a follow-up that we had prepared for this, which is that many states have a designated public records ombudsman uh, to ensure that agencies comply with public records requests. So it sounds like you're in favor of that. Uh, I just wanted to give the other candidates a chance to weigh in. Uh, Deputy Secretary Winters, what do you think? Sure. This is something that we've advocated for for several years. Um, and it's gotten a little bit of traction in the legislature, uh, but uh, there's never been the appetite, I guess, to fully fund it. Um, it wasn't made a priority, although Jim Condos and I have been, been pushing for this for years. It's a way to make um, resolution of these issues much more accessible to Vermonters, because right now to enforce the Public Records Act or the open meeting law, you have to go to court. And that's just not possible for a lot of Vermonters who, you know, they, they hit that dead end and they're very frustrated. And we get those calls of saying this, you know, this, this agency, this board, this public body is, is not being transparent. They're not giving us the records that we're entitled to because the public has the right to know. Um, and they run up against that brick wall and they're not going to go to Superior Court and file a lawsuit uh, to get that taken care of. So this ombuds person would be a mediator of sorts. It could um, be a bridge between um, that initial complaint and an actual, having to actually go to court. And it could resolve a lot of these issues in favor of the public's right to know because open government is good government and all of government should be working as though 630 plus thousand Vermonters are looking over their shoulder. I'm, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. We were only supposed to give you guys about 30 seconds. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought uh, we were I should have flagged that earlier. Uh, but Representative Copeland hands us. It's uh, you get to go now. Thank you, and I will use less than 30 seconds. I'm quite sure. Um, I think the Public Records Ombudsman Office is a great idea um, because, as uh, as I've talked about before, it is the uh, inconsistencies in interpretation of Public Records. Uh, act uh, requirements that I think people find most frustrating. And so if we had that one-stop shop that could help um, the Vermonter who wants access to what their government is doing uh, and also be a, uh, an entity to, to hold to account the, uh, the agency that, um, that they're asking for records from, uh, we would be in a much better place. All right, great, thanks so much. Uh... My next question is, uh, thanks to a bill passed this legislative session and signed into law, Vermont now has a statutory ethics code that binds all three branches of government, but its ethics commission still lacks any power to investigate wrongdoing or sanction public servants who run afoul of their ethical obligations. Do you support giving the commission those powers? And do you have any other ideas for further strengthening Vermont's ethics rules? Uh, City Clerk Odom, you get to go. Yeah, that's been a real point of frustration for me, just as, as an outsider looking into the legislative process. We, we need a, a, a firmer ethics framework with some you know, type of follow-up, some sort of enforceability to it. We lag way, way, way behind on this compared to other states. So, I mean, the short answer is, yes, absolutely, I support it. And I love the idea of really bringing the Secretary of State's office front and center in that process. I think that's an office that is uniquely suited to be this sort of not, not maybe not enforcement officer because it's not exactly a big enforcement office, but at least that point of contact where these things can be, you know, managed, directed, hashed out. But oh, it's been such a long time coming. We we've, we've got to do a better job than we do. And frankly, it's a it's a great question following up the last one because ethics really goes hand in hand with the open records requests. I think you often see those, those two topics when you talk about folks outside the legislative process, outside the government, coming in to address things that concern them. They'll, they would access both. So um, yeah, I can't, I can't say strongly enough how disappointing it's been that we've made so little progress on that. All 
All right, thank you. Representative Copeland Hansis, you get to go next. Um, thank you. I, um, I have been really pleased to be part of the development of our, um, our ethics, our state ethics panel, as well as uh, enacting the state code of ethics this past year. Um, and it has been a, a deliberative process as we've moved through this, um, taking time and care to make sure that, um, that we are looking at this, uh, this code that uh, public officials will need to abide by from every different angle. Um, and, and I think that uh, it is the next logical step for us to move to an enforceable um, code of ethics. We have to understand though that that means uh, asking the legislature and the administration to agree to appropriating um, more money to create those positions. Um, the, the slow and incremental uh, steps that we've taken so far uh, have given us an ethics code um, and an ethics commission that can answer questions from, uh, from public officials uh, about how to abide by those codes. And we can certainly um, investigate taking the next steps, uh, recognizing that, uh, you know, Vermont is not uh, uh, an infinite well of, um, of money and that we need to make sure that we're right sizing it to be Vermont scale. All right, Deputy Secretary Winters, you're up. Thank you. As Deputy Secretary of State, I, I lead the legislative agenda across the street and um, Secretary Condos and I decided we really needed to push for an ethics commission several years ago. Spent a lot of time in the state house trying to make that happen. Um, it was a very difficult process. Uh, we pushed to get it, you know, Ver Vermont is one of the few places that didn't have an ethics commission or an ethics code. Uh, we pushed and pushed for years to get it as part of, uh, you know, one more piece of restoring faith and trust in our government. Uh, when it finally did pass, it was a good start, but it didn't go far enough. They didn't get the resources they needed. They didn't have any real authority, uh, any enforcement authority, uh, authority to be able to make a difference. So really the ethics commission as passed was toothless. Um, so it, it should have gone way further by now. It, it hasn't gotten there. Um, it is slowly getting somewhere. We said when it passed, it was a good start, but we still need to give them the enforcement authority and the resources to be successful to make a real difference as an ethics commission. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, we will now uh, turn to candidate to candidate questions. Uh, each candidate may ask another candidate of their choosing one question. These should be questions and not speeches. You'll have 90 seconds to answer, and we may ask or allow follow-up questions. Deputy Secretary Winters, who would you like to query and what is your question? Uh, Representative Copeland Hansis, please. Uh, as I talked Great. to Vermont, sure, should I go ahead? Sorry. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, sorry. All right. So as I campaign and talk to Vermonters across the state, I'm reminded of how complex the Secretary of State's office really is. I'd like to know what in your background has prepared you to manage an 80 person agency with a $17 million budget, four divisions, an investigative unit, a law enforcement agency, and a broad array of responsibilities for services that are so critical to Vermont. Uh, thanks for the question, Chris. I appreciate it. Um, so in, uh, in my lifetime of experiences, I have a, a breadth of experience um, from being a business owner where it was my job to, uh, to manage the budget and to um, make sure that we met payroll and, and paid our bills on time. Um, and I have also worked in very complex uh, and complicated uh, legislative environments where there are political pressures um, pushing and pulling at, uh, at legislators from many different directions. Uh, I think overall, the ability to manage people, uh, the, the ability to be an open and accessible uh, leader of an organization is really what's critical to the success of that organization. Um, I'm very experienced at listening to the people around me who have that investigative experience or have that uh, professional regulation experience, uh, asking them what they see can be done better. 
um, and listening to that answer and implementing those changes. And so I feel like I'm very well prepared to be uh, an active manager and, uh, and an open and accessible leader. Thank Great. You. Thank you. And we will now turn to you, Representative Copenhansis, to ask a question of another candidate. I would love to ask John Odom a question. Um, so John, as I travel around uh, to events and parades across the state, I keep hearing from Vermonters how excited they are to elect women uh, in leadership positions this election cycle. Um, often when they hear about my 18 years of experience in elected office, uh, they walk away excited to vote for a qualified woman for Secretary of State. Do you think it's time to elect more women to statewide office? Oh, absolutely. Um, and you know, I know that's the, that's the energy out there. I share it. I'm part of it. Um, and it's something, you know, be honest with you, if that's the criteria that someone wants to take in this particular race, you know, given that you're completely qualified, Chris is completely qualified. Um, I get it. I understand. I don't have any bitterness for that. And I think it's a completely legitimate approach to take, not this with just this election, but any election in the state. And, um, you know, I would never, if someone, you know, holds that belief, and again, I get it, I, I to a large degree share it, obviously I'm gonna vote for myself in this one, but, um, you know, I would never try to dissuade somebody from, from approaching elections that way. It's completely legitimate, it's more than legitimate. It's, it's, um, it's, it's a good way to approach these, so. And I'm gonna uh, bend the rules a little bit and ask Deputy Secretary Winters if he wants to answer that question as well. Sure, I'd love to, thank you. I absolutely believe we need more women in leadership positions and I know Vermont will be a better place because of it. Um, you, you may have seen a lot on social media, we're really lucky here in Vermont to have the Emerge program, a program that trains democratic women to run for higher office. I myself have benefited from the program by recruiting a number of its graduates to my campaign team. Uh, I've supported it by volunteering as an instructor I've long benefited and learned from the strong women leaders in my life, including Deb Markowitz, who's a former secretary of state and mentor to me and my campaign treasurer. So in my 25 years in the secretary of state's office, I've seen the change in culture and in leadership in state government, and it's been a good thing. The vast majority of our leadership team in the secretary of state's office are women. We have three out of our four directors, both assistant directors, our general counsel, and I'm always able to make better decisions when I have diverse voices and perspectives at the table. So we're a family forward agency and we accommodated the needs of our team, many of them women, many of them mothers through the pandemic. And I have to say that it's not right that women bear a disproportionate burden of childcare and home logistics, uh, but we were understanding and we, we did what we needed to do to make them successful. Last but not least, I'm really looking forward to being able to choose my own deputy as Secretary of State, and I'm confident that she is going to be an amazing addition to the top leadership team. Thank you. And we will now turn to City Clerk Odom to ask uh, the last candidate, the last question, at least in this round of another candidate, uh, who would you like to ask a question of and what is your question? Oh, heavens, eeny, meeny, miny, mo, right? Um, well, um, I guess I'll ask Sarah since she asked me. It just seems only fair. Now, I've promised not to run against anybody here. So I'm going to give you a softball. All right. I just, I, I give you an easy one. You're going to thank me for this Sunday, right? So, you know, one of us is going to win this race. And if you win, I know Chris has got some solid ideas. I've got a lot of my own ideas, particularly about how to you know, have more values approach to OPR, uh, crazy ideas on election, well, they're not crazy, but uh, would you as Secretary of State have an open door policy to myself and to the Deputy Secretary um, well, to listen to those ideas, to take them very seriously, to take them into consideration and, and uh, maybe act on them? Uh, thank you, John, for the question. And um, it's a great question because, um, you know, Viewers out there may not know this, but John and Chris and I have uh, worked side by side uh, for many years, uh, worked on uh, on the same uh, team, essentially trying to move forward uh, with uh, with priorities that we share in common. Uh, and so, yes, if 
if I prevail and become Secretary of State, I would love to reach out not only to you, John Odom, as uh, Montpelier City Clerk, uh, but to all clerks around the state. Um, in fact, I've, I've already begun to do that as I've been out campaigning in the last month since the legislature got done. Uh, really hearing ideas, um, hearing critiques of things that aren't working well and uh, listening for ideas of things that we could implement. Um, and I know that I've always had a good relationship with Chris and I have found him to be an open and honest uh, broker. So I would value his, uh, his advice and input as well. Great, thanks very much. And I'll turn it back over to Lola. All right, thank you. Um, we will have another round of candidate to candidate questions in a bit, but for now we'll return to questions from us uh, to each of you. Lawmakers, this legislative session considered and ultimately dropped a proposal to move Vermont to a ranked choice voting system in federal elections. But advocates say they'll try again next year. Would you support Vermont shifting to a system in which voters get to rank their candidates in order of preference? Uh, City Clerk Odom, you get to go first. This is an interesting question. Uh, you know, the, the advocate in me has always been for ranked choice voting. The election administrator in me has great concerns. I, as a clerk, I try to imagine doing a hand recount in a, in a ranked choice voting election. But having said that, the problems are problems that can be solved. It's the right thing to do. Ranked choice voting is the right thing to do. It's been working in Maine. And I think it's up to the Secretary of State's office to finally call that question in, in Vermont. What I would like to do is go on a little bit of a traveling road show bring together advocates, bring together regular voters, bring together folks from Maine and go around the state and have that conversation with Vermonters. Call the question, see if there's buy-in and maybe try to reassure folks who have concerns about it. So um, yeah, it's a 100% yes. And it's something I'm actually uh, saying quite a bit on the campaign trail. All right, thank you. Representative Copeland Hansis, you get to go next. Thank you. Um, I do support ranked choice voting, and um, I was really pleased as chair of government operations to move forward with the Burlington Charter change um, that enacts ranked choice voting for their city council races. Uh, those are races that often have more than two candidates. It's an ideal place for people to be able to exercise uh, their right to rank uh, the folks on the ballot in their order of preference. And I think it's also a tremendous opportunity for the rest of the state to really watch how it works in Burlington and become more familiar with it so that we can move forward with that. If I become Secretary of State, I will uh, move to uh, enact ranked choice voting for our presidential primary in 2024. Uh, that again is another race where there's often um, more than two candidates, even though the two major party candidates tend to be uh, the ones that, that uh, get all of the attention, uh, there are often uh, many folks on that list. And I think um, Vermonters would be able to use that presidential primary race as an opportunity to see how ranked choice uh, works. And, uh, and then we can have a conversation about adopting it uh, more broadly once Vermonters are familiar with how that system works. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Secretary Winters, you get to go. Short answer is yes. I'm also in favor of ranked choice voting and think we ought to bring it to Vermont. But like John, uh, as, an, as someone who works with election administrators and talks to a lot of voters, we need to do it carefully and we need to do it thoughtfully for it to actually succeed and, and be fully embraced by Vermonters. Um, we've been a leader in so many ways. Like nationally, we're looked at as the gold standard for elections. MIT's election performance index ranks us number one in election performance for the last two presidential elections. We lead the way and we've been successful and we've been able to get those things done with broad support from all parties because we are thorough, because we are careful, because we are collaborative. And I think you know there are so many uh, positives that come along with ranked choice voting, um, ensuring majority support for winners, um, reducing negative campaigning, allowing voters to vote their conscience instead of voting strategically. I think we need to continue the conversation about ranked choice voting in 2023. And I'm proud of my track record and my ability to build consensus, to solve complex problems the right way, 
with broad support. And I plan to lead that discussion in January if I'm elected Secretary of State. All right, thanks so much. One of the lesser known parts of the Secretary of State's office is the Office of Professional Regulation or OPR, the division that regulates about 50 professions from tattooist architects. What licensing changes, if any, would you make at OPR to make it easier for people to enter the workforce? And conversely, do you think OPR needs help beefing up enforcement? Uh, Representative Copeland Hansis, you get to go. Uh, thank you so much. Um, and this is a topic that I bring up a lot on my travels around the state, um, because I know as a, a small business owner myself and as someone who owns some commercial property where uh, a couple of licensed professionals uh, are making their living, uh, there, there is, uh, there's more that we can do. Um, but I'll start first and foremost with, uh, with what the what the point of OPR should be, which is to regulate with the lightest touch. Um, this, this lightest touch needs to be about uh, consumer protection and public safety, uh, health and safety, um, and not about um, it putting in, uh, in people's way an arbitrary barrier to them being able to, uh, to go to work and to earn to their maximum. Uh, we have been working for a number of years to reduce those barriers, and as Secretary of State, I will continue to reduce those barriers. Uh, but there's one other thing that I would like to see the Secretary of State's office do with the Office of Professional Regulation that I think would be a real benefit to these small, uh, oftentimes sole proprietor businesses. And that is we need to take the, the listing that OPR has of all of the licensed professions, and we need to turn it uh, outwardly with a consumer focus, sort of a, an Angie's list, maybe without the reviews. Um, so that if you live in, um, in Brandon and you are looking for a forester, you can find a listing near you of people who are practicing forestry. That will be an asset to the licensed professionals who at the end of the day probably don't have the energy to do all of the promotion and marketing they like to for their own business. Okay, thank you so much. Next up is Deputy Secretary Winters. Well, thank you for this question. OPR is of course near and dear to my heart. I started out as a staff attorney there 25 years ago. I was the director of OPR for several years. And um, in that time, we became a nation leading operation there where we paid attention not only to public protection, the main focus of OPR is public protection uh, from 50,000, uh, sorry, 50 professions and 80,000 licensees. We have a whole law enforcement unit an investigative unit. It's a very, um, one of the least known divisions that performs a really important function in state government. Just about everybody visits an OPR licensee at least once a week, if not more with all of those 50 professions. But we built this nation leading uh, professional regulation system that is as uh, representative Copeland Hansis, I'm, I'm happy that she remembers is um, it's, it's about going only as far to protect the public as necessary and not an inch farther so that you don't interfere with the marketplace. And we did a lot of great work with the legislature, uh, with the House Government Operations Committee, with the Senate GovOps Committee on this. Um, so th that's a really important function in the Secretary of State's office. We need to do more to turn OPR into a workforce development tool. We can always use more enforcement resources. That just means that we would speed up the, the licensing and processing times. And I do just have to comment on the, on the Angie's List idea. You know, I've been doing this work for 25 years at OPR. It, there's a big difference between regulating and promoting. And you know, the other thing about this is that anyone can download a list of OPR licensees right now and sort by town and, and find which licensees are in your town, but you really need to keep the public protection, the regulation separate from the promotion or the advertising. It's really not a function that OPR should be doing. Okay, all right, now we'll turn to City Clerk Odom. A lot of thoughts about OPR after hearing, Chris, what you just said, I don't think you're gonna like one of them. Um, it's interesting, as soon as I told folks I was running for Secretary of State, um, I had licensed professionals coming to me with sharing their opinions and uh, I wasn't necessarily expecting that. I think speaking broadly about what they were telling me is that there's a, there's a feeling they would like to be more involved in, in OPR, more involved in the process. 
more involved in opportunities for uh, you know creating professional development opportunities. Um, so that's I mean that's clearly the first thing I would do is bring those folks into the process more than they they already are, and uh, you know let them largely take the lead on on what we do, how we do it, how we enforce it. Now OPR is an extraordinary resource. It's a it's it's a it's a very large chunk of the government, and when I talk about being a little more activist, a little more uh, representing our values in the Secretary of State's office, I'm mainly talking about OPR. I think it's an extraordinary medium for getting out into in front of business people, licensees across the state. For example, uh, things like the um, Equal Pay Compact, which would quadruple or more the amount of signatories if the Secretary of State pushed that out there. I think we can promote these type of values-driven approaches that we all bring as Democrats into the office and be just a little, little more active, a little more active on, on uh, pushing that message and some of these important messages out to the community. Okay, um, I think now we're turning it over to Paul. Hey, in Vermont, as in most states, the legislature has the final say on redistricting. That means the elected officials currently in power get to draw the maps that carve up the electorate for the next 10 years. That process leaves the map vulnerable to attacks that lines were drawn to protect incumbents or the party in power. The Tripartisan Legislative Apportionment Board acts in an advisory capacity, but its suggestions have historically been ignored by lawmakers. Should the redistricting process change? If yes, who do you think should get to decide what Vermont's legislative map looks like? And we will start uh, with Deputy Secretary Winters on this one. Sure, thank you, Paul. I, I staffed the Legislative Apportionment Board over the past year. We had 20 plus meetings where they worked very hard to create uh, a couple of maps. There was a, a majority map and a minority map. One was single member districts, one was multi-member districts. And it was always really frustrating to think in the back of our minds that at the end of the day, it was going to go to the legislature and there was a real chance that they would just kind of take the map and just put it right in the garbage can. That has happened in, in past years. Um, I don't think that we've had the, the real partisan problems that other states have had where they engage in actual gerrymandering, where uh, they actually pick their voters instead of the voters picking them. But there's a, a very real conflict of interest right there built in with the legislators picking their, uh, drawing their districts. I think um, the legislature did a great, great job this year. It seemed very bipartisan, tripartisan, but overall, I do believe we should have some reform to make an independent redistricting commission, uh, take that decision out of the legislature's hands, uh, have it be done by people who aren't directly affected by the drawing of those districts. Great, uh, City Clerk Odom, you're next. Well, I think in broad strokes, I agree with what Chris just said. Um, I know it's got to be tough to be on that commission because I've been involved in a couple of these redistricting processes. And I know they put in a lot of work and the legislature takes it or doesn't. But honestly, I, I've got to be got to be honest. I think the legislature has done a fairly good job. I think there have been movements and attempts to, you know, maybe do a little partisan gerrymandering. And generally, they don't end up getting included in the final product. So um, I, think, I think the idea of, of having a body that does not have that kind of direct in, you know, engagement with where the lines should be is a lot like having an elected clerk that's not answerable to the city council or the select board on running their elections. Um, so I think, there's, I think there's a lot of truth in there, but it would be low on my priority list. I, I gotta be honest because I don't think that system is broke. I think the legislature has done a pretty good job, but it's something we need to stay vigilant about because yeah, he's absolutely right. We, it's, it's not ideal to have um, that particular body being in charge of that particular uh, issue. And if we ever did have issues with gerrymander, gerrymandering, yeah, it could turn on a dime and we need to be ready for that. And finally to you, Representative Copeland Hansis. Thank you. Um, so this year I was chair of the committee that led the legislative uh, reapportionment process. Um, and, uh, and I think that Vermonters should be assured that 
our process was very open um, and fair and, uh, and inclusive of voices and opinions from all over the state. Um, because at the end of the day, um, we have to answer to our constituents. And, you know, I'm standing in line uh, in the grocery store next to someone who, you know, who might want to know what the redistricting process was like. And I need to be able to answer that in a straight face. So your elected government, um, your elected legislators in Vermont are very open and accessible because um, you can find them in your communities and you can ask them those challenging questions. Uh, with respect to the idea of having um, an, uh, an impartial or apolitical board uh, do this work, the challenge with that is we don't have a party registration process in Vermont. Nobody is required to state publicly, I am a Democrat, I am a Republican. And so finding a way to put a balanced commission together uh, is very complicated in, in our state. And it really comes down to, um, uh, you know, just an, an issue of faith. Right now, the Legislative Apportionment Board has two Republicans, two Democrats, two progressives, and a chair who is appointed um, by the Supreme Court Justice. So you would think that that would be very fair and very balanced. Um, and yet there have been uh, partisan um, uh, partisan challenges with uh, with the work that's come out of the Legislative Apportionment Board. Thank you. And we're going to stay on this topic uh, for a quick 30 second follow up, going to get a little bit into the weeds here, but just quickly into the weeds. Um, and we'll go in the same order here as the last question. Do you think it would be more fair for each legislative district to be served by just one member rather than the mix of single and multi-member districts that the state currently has. So we'll go again to Deputy Secretary Winters uh, first, 30 seconds. I think there's a lot of a lot of benefit to having a single member district. The difficulty, you know, that's equal representation. The difficulty is applying that to a state that has mountains and is geographically difficult to piece together the right size districts with affinity for, you know, in their communities, in their geography, in the shared schools. So Yes, in theory, uh, in practicality, it is very, very difficult to do. The clerk Odom. Well, I think generally speaking, yes, that should be the standard, but it is more complex in Vermont, um, partly because of our smaller communities. But you know, one of the criteria for redistricting and drawing new lines is to look at sort of established political or community or neighborhood lines. And in Montpelier, there was in part of the proposal was to split Montpelier into two districts and we're a two member district as it is. And my board of civil authority and I supported them, uh, opted to ask to recommend that that not be done, that it stay a two member district. And I think Montpelier is a good example because there was no place to draw that line that wasn't arbitrary. And that's the problem you're gonna run into with some of these communities. So yeah, I think, I think as a general ideal standard, it should be the standard we go for, but there's gonna be some cases where it just not, may not make sense for the local communities and the local neighborhoods. Thank you. And Representative Copeland hands us 30 seconds for this one, please. I'm gonna talk really fast because I have a lot to say about this because we were deeply immersed in this um, for the first three months of the legislative session. Um, you know, there are places in Vermont where single seat districts work, uh, work better than two member districts. And in fact, we created more single member districts than was contained in the previous map in order to break up some of those large rural two seat districts that encompass five or six or seven towns. But there are also places like Middlebury and Barry City. And as John said, Montpelier, where the municipality is ideally sized to be a two seat district and drawing a line down the middle of that would be arbitrary. There are also places like um, Jericho and Underhill, where one of the towns is a little bit too big to be a single seat district. One is a little too small. When you put them together, they make an ideally sized two seat district. The communities like that. They're used to that um, and, uh, and that works for them. Whereas Charlotte and Heinsberg, uh, one being too big and one being too small, uh, we are having to be, you know, take a little bit more out of Heinsberg and put it in that Charlotte district in order to balance those two single seat districts. And uh, Heinsberg ends up feeling a little bit resentful of having 
uh, having more of their community represented by the neighboring district. So there's a lot of complexities. Um, Vermont's a beautiful place and we just need to keep listening to Vermonters when we make these decisions. Thank you. And I apologize for asking a three minute question and asking you to answer it in 30 seconds. Um, but talking fast is a good approach. Um, next question, uh, a very different topic. In recent decades, outgoing governors have entered into agreements with, Secretary of, with the Secretary of State's office to keep certain records out of the public eye for an agreed upon number of years. The most recent two governors, Peter Shumlin and Jim Douglas, struck deals with the Secretary of State to keep their records secret for six years. Howard Dean kept his secret for 10 years. How long do you believe the public should have to wait to access such records? And we will start with you, City Clerk Odom. One, it's an easy one. Um, I, I think there's, there's, it's understandable to have at least a little wait time. Let the, you know, the new administration, if there's a new administration, settle in, let the politics settle in around them to the new legislature. But, uh, I mean, let's be serious. I think if you look back at history, not just in Vermont, but elsewhere, this business of locking down the records of the executive branch doesn't tend to work out well. Um, there have been problems national level and local level. I think we've seen some of those play out. So I would say one, just as a just as a matter of letting the politics settle down and then throw open the doors. In fact, you know, my inclination is to say zero, but I'm gonna, I think, be a little more pragmatic and say one. Great. And we'll go to uh, Deputy Secretary Winters next on this one. Sure. Uh, six is up is is too long. Um, we had we usually have quite a, a battle between the administration, the attorney general's office, and our state archives and records administration over how long those are going to be kept sealed. I understand that there are some privacy issues. There are some things that um, that the administration needs to work through and make sure that they're not uh, revealed inadvertently. Some personal information, personal correspondence, takes a little while to bring all of those records into the state archives. Um, but it should it definitely be a shorter period of time than than six years, probably closer to the to the one to two range, as as John has said. And Representative Copeland Hansis. So you know, before I talk about uh, the length of time, I guess I think it's incumbent on Vermonters to ask the question of why is it up to a negotiation? Why is it sometimes six and sometimes ten, or sometimes uh, you know a different number? I think there should be consistency across the board. Uh, and I would advocate for four years. That is two gubernatorial election cycles uh, beyond somebody's term in office. And that should be plenty of time. Great, thank you very much. Um, and one more question before we go back to candidate to candidate questions. Uh, so this one for each of you. Earlier this year, roughly half of incumbent Vermont legislators failed to file mandatory campaign finance reports on time. It wasn't the first time state lawmakers ignored the laws they themselves had passed. In 2018, according to the House Ethics Panel, one fifth of House members never filed mandatory financial disclosures while running for office. Secretary of State Jim Condos has said of legislators that he, quote, can't be their babysitter, unquote. But are there additional steps his office can, uh, the office you aspire to lead can and should take to ensure that candidates follow the law. And we will start with Representative Copeland Hansis on this one. Um, yes, there absolutely are. And there are a few things that could be done without any legislative action. Um, first and foremost, um, just in the same way that the Office of Professional Regulation sends out a reminder to all of the regulated professionals that it's time to renew their license, including a handy link to the portal in which they uh, need to log in to renew their license, uh, the Secretary of State's office can and should uh, send that information and that portal out as a reminder. Uh, over and above that, I think the Secretary of State's office uh, could also um, simply let all candidates know that one week after a filing deadline is passed, uh, they will release a list of uh, folks who have not yet filed. I think that's 
sort of sunshine would go a long way to reminding people that uh, that is important for them to file their campaign finance filings. Look, I know as a candidate, you know, on the campaign trail at the time I was juggling, uh, you know, three little kids running a business. Um, there were times when I was late with my filing, but you know what would have gotten my attention? An email with the link uh, reminding me that, you know, that my filing is due, you know, tomorrow or the next day. Uh, I think that's a basic common courtesy and uh, and would go a long way to improving compliance. Deputy Secretary Winters, you're up next. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, I think it's important to reflect on, on why this is important for campaign finance disclosures to even be filed. Again, it's transparency. It's the public's right to know uh, who's donating to a campaign, uh, what sort of expenses are, are coming out of a campaign. It's really important that these things be filed. We, we post this on our website. Uh, we often put it out on social media saying, hey, campaign finance deadline coming up. Many, many legislators don't have a problem remembering, you know, first of the month, 15th of the month, uh, the schedule that's in our campaign finance handbook that, that's online. We certainly could uh, institute email reminders um, and we certainly could, um, you know, flag that a little bit more. But uh, as Secretary Kondo said, it, it's really the, the legislators passed the law. They set these deadlines. Uh, they really should be able to comply with them. And it's important that they do. And most of them do. And there's no real penalty or enforcement other than a little bit of public embarrassment. So for the most part, we will work with legislators to get those things filed, uh, get them online, get them out there so that the public can see them. Um, and it's eventually no harm, no foul, but they really should be uh, following those deadlines and, and getting them in. And as a first time candidate myself, I'm understanding with a fresh perspective uh, that this needs to be done um, and that I have to pay attention to it and I have to take the time to get it done. And I do. I believe the public embarrassment is where we come in. Um, finally, to you, City Clerk Odom. Well, I got to tell you, I did not know those statistics. Um, that's a little shocking. Actually, that tells me that the system is not working and it's in a bit of a crisis. Um, yeah, I think, you know, uh, the idea of a week long grace period, reminder emails, maybe reminder calls, that's a great thing. But and I, I think we're all three in general agreement on this, although it, maybe it's a question of degree, but sunshine, sunshine, sunshine. Um, you know, if folks don't get it right, it shouldn't just be a little report that goes off to other candidates. That needs to be flown on a flagpole. Um, honestly, I think, I, I mean, if, if enforcement is a possibility, I think you could talk about fining uh, uh, campaigns um, once they pass that grace period. I think that would be a completely reasonable discussion. And frankly, I would probably lean in favor of that. But short of that, yeah, sunshine. Make sure everybody knows what, which candidates are doing this. I want to know now. You've given me that information. I'm going to go check this out when we're done. But um, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, back to you, Lola. Uh, you are <laughs> muted. So. Sorry about that. Um, all right, thank you. We'll now return to candidate to candidate questions. Uh, it's the same rules as before. You pick a candidate, you ask a question, please void speeches. Uh, the person you query will have 30 seconds to answer. Okay, Clerk Odom, you get to go. Who would you like to query and what is your question? Well, I got one of them before. I'll switch to the other one now. Okay, Chris, again, I ain't running against you. I'm running for myself. I'm no gotchas, no corner you. So you get the same question. Uh, basically, if, if you win this election, are you going to take the policies, the proposals that Sarah and I both have may differ from yours really into serious consideration. And you know, when I say that, I am particularly thinking about some of the cybersecurity proposals that I'm gonna be putting forward, which are really gonna be paradigm shifts. So that's probably the toughest one, but yeah, your door be open. And just yeah. to clarify, you'll have uh, 90 seconds for each of these answers. Great. So. 
Go ahead. Thanks, Paul. The answer is yes. I'm a much uh, better listener than I than I am speaker. I am much more comfortable that way, bringing voices to the table. We have you know a cons consortium of clerks that we bring in in all the time. Well, not all the time, but through 2020, it was all the time. Less frequently recently. Uh, to advise us on, on on boots on the ground, you know, how do we make these changes? What what's working well? What's not? Um, and knowing your expertise in cybersecurity, I would definitely be open to that conversation. I know you've had some of those conversations with with Will Senning, um, and I'd love to hear your ideas. I've heard some some fresh ideas from you and from Representative Copeland Hansis during the course of this campaign. Um, and I would welcome that. I would welcome uh, both of you. We've been a great partner with the legislature over the years, uh, and Sarah's been a great partner in, in all of this work on the House Government Operations Committee, and then also some really great partners on the Senate Government Operations Committee. So I'm the kind of person who listens, uh, who brings stakeholders to the table, who respects their opinions, uh, and wants to have multiple voices to help me make an informed decision. So the, the short answer is yes. All right, uh, thank you. We will now turn to um, Deputy Secretary Winters. Who would you like to query and what's your question? Um, sure, I guess I'd ask um, uh, Representative Copeland Hansis again, um, which of the divisions would you like to learn more about? Um, I would love to spend some more time in the state archives. Um, having toured the state archives uh, when I first took over as chair of government operations, I was fascinated uh, with just the, the treasure trove of historic um, documents and artifacts that are contained there. Um, and I think that there are a lot, uh, there's a lot contained there that Vermonters uh, would be surprised at and would be really pleased to feel a little more um, uh, closeness to. Uh, I know that I was pleased uh, to, to learn more about it. And so I think that um, helping to make sure that Vermonters know all of the um, treasure trove of historic documents and artifacts that are uh, contained within that building um, would be my goal as Secretary of State. Thanks for giving Vasara some love. They don't always get mentioned. <laughs> They're usually third on the list, right? <laughs> Well, Representative Copeland Hansis, now it's your turn. Uh, who would you like to ask a question to? Um, so I asked John my last question. So I'll ask Chris a question now. Um, so I have been all around the state in my 18 years as a representative and have had many, many conversations with constituents. Uh, recently, I keep hearing from Vermonters who are really worried about their fundamental rights being eroded. Um, many are worried, given the leaked Supreme Court opinion, um, that this is really only the tip of the iceberg in terms of undermining uh, equality and civil liberties that uh, Vermonters have fought for, um, and indeed that I have fought for as a state representative. Um, are you prepared for what's coming at the state, and are you willing to use your voice and your platform to vigorously defend Vermont and the rights that residents count on? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for that question. You know, what you're referring to here, I support abortion rights. I know that I myself have benefited from the women in my life who've had the right to choose. And as a cisgender man, I know it's important for me to stand up and be an ally for reproductive rights for all genders. I actually held Proposition 5 in my hands. After you all passed it, I got the official document in my hands and the weight of that moment was not lost on me. It's, it's an amendment to the constitution. It's a really big deal. This right is a really big deal. And that right is made possible by voting. And that's why we need to hold the line in ensuring the right to vote for every eligible voter. It's the right to vote is the right from which all other rights flow. And I also believe that even people who don't agree with me should have the right to vote and that the, the secretary of state's office needs to remain nonpartisan. And that's what I've been doing the last seven years that I've been overseeing elections in Vermont. I've been protecting your right to vote to ensure our democracy works for you and all of those other rights are protected. Thank you very much. It, it looks like we'll have time for uh, two more, more substantive questions and then we'll turn to a quick lightning round. Um, so the next question 
uh, is over the last dozen years, Vermont has moved its primary date uh, from September to late August to early August. Do you think that election day should remain uh, when it is or should it move to another time of year? Um, and, uh, and by that, I mean the primary election date. Uh, if the latter, when do you think it should be held? And we will start with Representative Copenhansis on this one. Uh, so I was in the legislature when we moved the primary date uh, to be where it is. And I probably, many Vermonters don't understand why the primary is as early as it is. Um, and, and that is for the purpose of making sure that we have time after the primary to, uh, to finalize the ballot and get those absentee ballots sent out to Vermonters who might be serving overseas. Uh, it's really important to make sure that every registered uh, voter has uh, the time and opportunity to cast that, uh, that ballot, which means that it needs to be able to be mailed um, and uh, received, contemplated, and returned. Um, I, I think that August uh, is a really difficult time for a primary, though. I'll be honest, um, you know, with school being out of session, uh, with people being distracted by summer vacation, it's not always the time of year that uh, people are paying uh, closest attention to vetting the candidates who come on their ballot. And so I think there's a lot more that we can do to make primary voting more accessible, including um, finding a way to move towards uh, mailing the, uh, primary ballots with some of the caveats that we spoke about earlier tonight. Um, but I think we also need to, um, the Secretary of State's office needs to, you know, get out there and shout from the mountaintops uh, that the primary is coming and engage in your right to choose. Thank you. Uh, and we'll go to Deputy Secretary Winters next. Sure. So August is a difficult time for a primary, and uh, we will be shouting from the mountaintops. You'll all be getting a, a postcard in the mail very soon, reminding you that you need to request your ballot if you'd like to vote by mail uh, for this primary. You'll automatically receive a ballot in the mail for the general election in November, but for August, you need to request it. And you can do that very easily online. You can call your town clerk or you can choose to vote in person on election day, but August is a difficult time. We could move the date back and, and uh, thank you, Sarah, for, for pointing out why that happens. I was looking at the sample ballots, the draft ballots that we're proofreading right now because the candidate filing deadline was uh, May 26th. Uh, and now we have until about June 25th to meet that 45 day uh, requirement for early voting for our military and overseas voters. So we have less than a month to proof those ballots and get them printed and get them ready for all the different jurisdictions, all the different ballot styles for the state of Vermont. So moving it back would be great even earlier in the year, uh, but then you start bumping up into the legislative session. And so that causes other problems if people are actively running uh, while they're in legislative session. So I don't think there's an easy fix here. I think we did our, our best with the early August primary uh, but it's not a time when people are paying attention. I also agree we ought to make it more accessible, make it as easy as possible for people to vote so we have greater turnout in the primary, which is a really important election that leads to who's on the ballot for the general election. City Clerk Odom. Yeah, actually, Chris said, got to the, the heart of what a lot of what I was going to say. It's tricky because there are a lot of states that had to move back their primary elections to meet that that goal, that, that deadline of getting those ballots to folks overseas. Uh, some states were, were brought to court and theirs ended up moving back even farther. So this business of August was sort of how far can we push it? Um, it made a lot of sense. Um, ideally, it would be back earlier, but then you bump into that problem where so many of our candidates for statewide office come out of the legislature and you bring that back closer to the end of the session and they're at just a, an unreasonable disadvantage uh, based on the laws now for campaigning and fundraising. So I don't love it where it is, but I don't see how you could really move it back any further without combining it with some sort of reform of when legislators can get involved in actively campaigning. Um, and that's a much bigger, bigger, bigger rock to push up the hill. So yeah, I think a lot of the answer is gonna be in universal mail-in voting. What's happening is we're starting to see with more and more folks voting, uh, early voting, it's more of an election season than an election day. And I think that approach and really nurturing that approach and seeing that 
really develop is going to be the answer to a lot of the problems we have with turnout and this problem as well. Thank you. Lola, final question before we turn the lightning round. All right, thank you. Uh, Winooski and Montpelier both allow non-citizens to vote in local elections. Brattleboro sought and failed to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in local elections. Do you support expanding the right to vote to these groups? Uh, Deputy Secretary Winters, you get to go. Sure, yes, uh, on both. Um, I think it's a local decision and the Secretary of State's office should support that for 16 and 17 year old uh, voting. You know, some of the best conversations I've had with young people, with, with my children, and I think the earlier you engage, the research shows that they're more likely to stay engaged. Uh, so when Brattleboro chose to do that, we are actually working to support them and make sure that the administration goes smoothly, uh, that they can actually do it. And, you know, also civics, civil, civil discourse, media literacy, it's another way to defend democracy. So uh, getting younger people involved in the issues that matter to them is, is a great thing. On uh, non-citizen voting, you know, there are, and, and John will be able to speak to this, he has it in Montpelier, but there are full-time residents who live and work in our communities. Uh, they pay taxes, you know, they're, they're full-fledged members of our communities, except they can't vote on local issues. So I think it's perfectly understandable that they have, should have a say in our local governance. And again, if a, a, a local community wants to do that, we should support that local choice. The Secretary of State can and has supported the cities and towns in the administration of this. Um, so we've helped municipalities get it on the ballot, we've helped implement it, and we help with supports on election day. So uh, yeah, I'm in favor of a, of a local decision on those two issues. All right, City Clerk Odom, you're up. This one's near and dear to my heart. Um, I spearheaded non-citizen voting in Montpelier started that conversation. And then the Winooski uh, uh, City Council reached out to me to start their own process. I really coordinated a lot of the testimony and getting it approved in the legislature. It's terrific. I mean, um, folks live in these communities, kids in school own property. They should have a say in, uh, in, in local decision-making. Um, it's certainly it's the way it was at the beginning of the, the history of the country. Our founding fathers, their children, their grandchildren voted alongside non-citizens on local issues and didn't think twice about it. Same with, with the 16-year-old uh, issue. I think the Secretary of State could go a long way to providing resources and support for this. And this is where I am going to get a little snippy about it. Part of, the, part of the reason I wanted to run for this office is that it didn't get any support from the Secretary of State's office. And just as an example, the way the law was passed for non-citizen voting created a real logistic challenge. Um, and fortunately, I'm a computer programmer. So I created a technical fix that enabled us to do it the way the legislature wanted us to. Winooski was in the same boat. I brought them my program, installed it, and trained them in it. And that's the kind of thing we shouldn't have had to do for ourselves. I think it could be a real clearinghouse of information and a real source of support for for communities who want to expand the franchise. Uh, Deputy Secretary Winters, do you want to respond at all? Thank you, you read my, read my mind. So I'll be a little bit snippy back to John and say it's it's a local decision and we should support, but it's, it's a decision that's not for every community. I don't think the Secretary of State's office ought to be advocating or pushing non-citizen voting or um, 16 and 17 year old voting on any community that doesn't want it. And just to be clear, it's, it's for voting on local issues. It's not for voting on, on anything federal, uh, anything statewide, um, local issues only. Uh, but it makes sense to me anyway, personally, for those things, for those communities that want it, but uh, we should not be pushing it. Thanks. All right, thank, thank you. Uh, Representative Copeland Hansis, you get the last word here. Great, thank you. Um, I was really proud to work on the non-citizen voting um, with Clerk Odom. Um, he did a great job of uh, really helping us understand the rationale and the reason why it made sense for Montpelier and uh, and then subsequently Winooski to do uh, to to allow non-citizen participation. Um, that. That um, bill, though, is uh, those two um, charter changes were ones that uh, that passed 
the 16 and 17 year old um, voting for Brattleboro elections uh, was vetoed. And unfortunately the legislature was not able to override that veto. And I think that that's really disappointing. Some of the rationale for engaging with young people um, on local elections is really, I think, fundamental to the future of our democracy. This is the opportunity for kids to, in, to be engaged in their town government, in, um, in voting for a select board, in, uh, in adopting their municipal budget. Uh, and it's a great opportunity for young people while they're still in school, while their social studies teachers have the ability to, uh, to teach a lesson around how to participate in town meeting or, uh, or in voting for the town budget. Um, because many times when young people get their first opportunity to vote, it is the time that is the, the, has the most upheaval that they've ever experienced in their lives, right? They've graduated from high school, they are maybe going to college, or maybe they're holding down a job for the first time, and figuring out how to vet candidates and go and vote for the first time is a really intimidating process. I think it's wonderful to invite young people to participate in that, to learn and grow uh, when they are still in high school. All right. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to close out with a very quick lightning speed round of questions here. Uh, each of you will have a chance to answer these questions, but please do so in just a few words, if you possibly can. Um, first one is, should election day be a holiday? Representative Copeland hands us. Absolutely. Deputy Secretary Winters. Let's do it. City Clerk Odom. Absolute no-brainer. Should have happened a long time ago. Does the Public Records Act apply to state legislators? City Clerk Odom. Should. Should apply to everything of the public interest. Deputy Secretary Winters. Yes, that's our interpretation. And Representative Copeland Hansis. Sure. Why well, disagree with my friends? Uh, should a majority of the House or Senate be allowed to hold meetings outside of the State House without the public and the press present? If not, will you call out that behavior? Uh, I guess I should tell you who's going next. Uh, Sec Deputy Secretary Winters, you're up. Yes. And Representative Copeland Hansis. Yes. Wait, I'm sorry. We should be clear. Do you think it's okay? <laughs> and then if not, will you call it? I'm assuming you're saying it's not okay and you will call it out. Is that, uh, is that what you meant to say, Mr. Yeah. Winters? Representative Copeland Kansas, is that what you meant to say as well? No, that's not what I meant to say. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad I clarified. <laughs> Can you elaborate in a few more words then? Um, I think there are uh, times when we might all find ourselves, for instance, at the annual Democratic um, dinner and or the annual Republican dinner. And uh, those are public open meetings that people can attend. I think that's perfectly acceptable. And City Clerk Odom, I'll separate those out. Uh, should this be allowed? Uh, and if not, would you call out the paper? Well, generally speaking, no, it should not be allowed. It's uh, the same, you know, what we have to live by under municipal government. So yeah, and I, and I would call that out. That should be, they shouldn't be talking about policy behind, you know, behind the curtain there. All right. Should the Electoral College be abolished? Representative Copeland hands us. Um, so we have adopted national popular vote, which essentially circumvents the Electoral College uh, once a, a majority of states have also joined that. Um, and so uh, it is a workaround that is slightly easier than, um, than abolishing the Electoral College. I think the person who wins the popular vote should be our president. Deputy Secretary Winters. Yes, we should do it our presidential election just like we do all of our other elections. And City Clerk Odom. Yeah, we should get rid of it. It is disturbingly undemocratic. And, uh, and I, I do appreciate what Sarah was saying about the sort of work around that's happening. That is a good one, but it ain't enough. Get rid of it. <laughs> and final question, uh, I will abuse my uh, authority here and ask you whether you will uh, support, defend and consider expanding Vermont's media shield law. Uh, City Clerk Odom. Well, I have to confess, I haven't looked at it closely enough. And generally, um, 
you know, my inclination is to say, yes, it's, it's hard to imagine shielding the media enough. I mean, it's such an important role you have in democracy. Democracy doesn't work uh, otherwise. So I want to look at it more closely, but my gut reaction is absolutely, let's expand it. We'll send you a copy. Deputy awesome. Secretary Winters. <laughs> Yes, I'm not sure what the expansion is. I'd want to see that, but I, I appreciate the work that you did on this the last time around, Paul, and we were big supporters of it at that time. And Representative Copeland Hansis. Uh, you can send me a copy of it as well, uh, but I am a firm believer that um, a free and fair press is critical to a functioning democracy, um, and we need to make sure that uh, we uphold that uh, at every turn. Great, back to you, Lola. All right, well, that concludes VT Digger's Democratic Secretary of State debate. Please stay tuned to vtdigger.org to learn more about upcoming events in the 2022 Digger debate series. I would like to thank all four candidates, all three candidates for joining us tonight, as well as the VT Digger staffers who made this possible, including Mike Doherty, Sarah Mirhoff, Natalie Williams, Kate Olney, Libby Johnson, and Taylor Haynes. I would also like to thank the sponsor of tonight's debate, the Vermont NEA, whose 13,000 members encourage all Vermonters to learn about the candidates and then to go out and vote. To support our coverage of Vermont government and politics, please visit, please visit bt.digger.org slash donate. Thank you again and good night. <laughs>